I said, Carolyn told you about one portion of our collection, and today I'll be telling you about developments in terms of acquisitions and our non-Western collection. So pieces from all over the world besides the United States and Europe. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and share my screen. International acquisitions this last year. We had lots of exciting new pieces come in. We have new parts of the world being represented. I wanted to start the uh, slide presentation with this piece um, because of those worlds. It, we believe it was actually made in South Carolina here in the United States, but as most of us I'm sure can recognize, uh, this is a piece made by a Hmong person, a, a person of the Hmong ethnic group. Um, it's an ethnic group that or, or originated in southern China, um, but they have migrated uh, further into Southeast Asia. And in this image, um, it depicts the turbulent and violent history that that group had in the 1970s when they were living in Laos in Southeast Asia. So many Hmong men became soldiers in sort of what is now often referred to as the secret war that the CIA was engaging in um, against the communists in Southeast Asia. And once the United States left, uh, very suddenly left uh, Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia. The Hmong were sort of at the, left to their own, um, they had to defend themselves against people who were uh, trying to kill them for having uh, worked or collaborated with the Americans. So many of them fled into Thailand. And so this image here shows a lot of the violence. It shows soldiers, airplanes, parachuting. Um, and then the, um, the Hmong people often fled across the Mekong River into Thailand, where whole uh, you know villages and large family groups settled in refugee camps in Thailand. Um, but then, as I'm sure most of us know, many of those people then resettled in the United States, all over the U.S., with high concentrations in places like California, the Twin Cities of Minnesota, down um, in Texas. So there are sort of large communities spread around the country, but. Um, I was not aware of one in South Carolina, so it's always interesting to see where people have moved to around the world. Um, so we do want to collect pieces from um, all groups, all ethnicities, and I, I find pieces particularly interesting when they have sort of a cross-cultural uh, theme or element to them. So that's why I thought I would start with that one. Uh, next, again, sort of a cross-cultural theme here. I'm, I know any of you who are docents will recognize these pieces. These are made by Rumi O'Brien of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Rumi's quilts are just fantastic. So engaging. So you just want to jump right into them, I feel. And uh, all of you that have heard about the creators um, interacting with these pieces have really, you know, warmed, warmed my heart. And we've shared that with Rumi, and I know she was so pleased to know that the LPS students coming through the museum really enjoyed them as well. Um, I love Jello; it jiggles, it just can't be beat. You can't top that quilt in my book. <laughs> I just love it so much. And um, so it's exciting to have you know we we hosted these pieces in our our Linda in our Pumphrey Family Gallery. Uh, as an exhibition, but to be able to have them on my acquisition uh, presentation is even more exciting because R J Rumi and her husband Jim did decide to donate all the pieces that were in that show to us, with the exception of one which we had borrowed from the University of Wisconsin. So we are just thrilled that we are going to get the entire Rumi O'Brien collection, so all the pieces that were in the show, minus the one, plus the rest of her works, which total about, in, in some, it's about 20 pieces. Um, and so we are going to be the representatives of her work. Um, and I just think she's so unique. There's really nobody else like her. Her technique is so great. Her vision is so personal. Um, and yet, even though it's very much specific to Rumi, I feel like it's also universal. We all feel like we can relate to her pieces. So. I'm just so excited that we are going to have the Rumi O'Brien collection. And as you can see in, in the um, object number at the bottom, 
these are so new, the collection. Although I, I, I should ask, say that they may be too specific, I don't know, but they were so new to the collection when I first made this presentation that they still say uh, 2020.006.xxxx because they had not yet been fully brought into the collection yet. So I hope you all are as excited about this as I am. And speaking of um, Japanese American artists, you all, I'm sure, remember Emiko Toda Loeb, uh, whose exhibition we hosted last year. So really, um, also technically um, highly developed, so uh, but but totally different looking. So I'm really excited that she donated another uh, couple of pieces to us while she was here last year. And we're also sort of in very preliminary pre preliminary discussions with her about building a much larger Emiko Toda Loeb um, collection to really represent her decades of quilt making. So of course, as you remember, she's really known for her double-sided log cabin pieces. And I hope you all were able to come to her demonstration last year because it really brought it home to me how those blocks are constructed. I, I kind of understood it, like I theoretically understood her process to see her in action and to have her explain it in person really helped kind of round it out and make it more real to me. I don't know if I would ever attempt one myself. <laughs> I still haven't quite hit that stage yet, but uh, they made them more um, approachable to me. Um, but what I love about them is that the two sides Often are so very different and yet complementary at the same time. But she, on one side, often has the large sweepings, which are, you know, take a lot of planning when you're working with not only a double sided block, but when you're working with geometric shapes. But she gets those sweeping arcs. And then a, a lot of times on the back side, she sticks with a bit more of a linear or geometric um, aesthetic. So, again, we're so thrilled. Um, that she and her husband have decided to donate to us. Um, and as always, we see exhibition artists work as a way to build a relationship with sort of the hopes that we can acquire some pieces to represent their life's work in our collection. Another artist in that same vein is Shizuko Kuroha, who you all remember as well. Um, her quilts we exhibited several years ago now. I can't believe it's been, what, three or four years now? Four years? I, something like that. Um, but again, um, she has a very distinct look. She, she has that sort of basic, almost limited palette in that she's working with antique indigo fabrics from Japan, indigos and sarasas, the sarasas being the, one that, the ones that have more of the browns and the reds and sort of tans to them. So she limits her palette in a lot of ways, but she comes up with such great compositions using that limited set of fabrics. So we have these two pieces, fireflies and flowers. I actually hand carried these home last fall when we were still able to travel. I brought these home with me. She, she donated these to us. Um, so also wind and a premonition of spring. So these are sort of part of a purchase donation that we are going to be, we are engaging on with her. We are purchasing another, um, I think it's eight quilts and then she's been donating as well to us. Um, we always love to work with artists who are willing to, to do both things, sell to us and donate to us. So um, we will have really the preeminent Kuroha collection anywhere, which is exciting. Um, and then moving away from Japan, we um, finished, I guess you would call it, collect, uh, building or finalizing our uh, Patricia Stoddard collection of quilts from Pakistan. And I'm sure you all remember Patricia She's someone who, with a really deep knowledge of Pakistani Raleigh's. She wrote the really the only book to date, the Bible of um, Pakistani Raleigh quilts, um, which is also covers uh, Western Indian Raleigh's. And so we're really thrilled to have uh, the quilts that she collected personally 
um, they now live with us and they will serve as like a really strong record, um, sort of the definitive record of what Pakistani Raleigh -like quilts um, are like from each of the different regions. This is from Lower Sindh, which is in the southern portion of Pakistan. Um, here are a couple more pieces from that collection. I always love the pieces that are functional. So these cradles, they just, I love them. I think they're wonderful that, that you combine um, these textile techniques, beautiful textile techniques involved, complicated, passed down from generation to generation. Um, and you don't just save that for the special textiles, you use them in your everyday textiles. So I love that there's a cradle here, a prayer rug, so, you know, uh, if you're a Muslim, you're praying, if you're, if you're the most devout, you're praying five times a day. And so this, this rug would be a, you know, a really vital part of your everyday life. And I love the aesthetic of these pieces from Rahim Yar Khan, where they alternate between those beautiful appliques and then the like bold patchwork uh, pieces. It's a very distinct aspect of the quilts from that region. And I love that. And I also love the little pompons everywhere. Because you got to have a, as Trish Stoddard always says, she, she, they like to put bling on their, on their quilts. Uh, a couple more pieces from Pakistan. Again, both from Sindh, the Sindh region. Patchwork, applique, you got everything, more pompons. These are um, probably made by the Mujba people who live in both Pakistan and Western India. And these ones are just fantastic. Martha Wallace actually donated these to us and she is a uh, research partner with Trish Stoddard. They both uh, did a lot of the research um, and ethnographic work for collecting and recollecting um, last year. Man, time is flying. Um, and so both of them have built up personal collections and it's wonderful that they see us as a home for the pieces uh, that they really loved adding to their collections. Okay, moving into um, kind of more into uh, Central and Western Asia, we have some beautiful quilted jackets, one from uh, Persia or Iran as it's known now, another from Syria, this sort of bolero style for the Syrian uh, quilted jacket is interesting because we have several other pieces that are probably from Syria, but they're full um, sort of knee length or calf length robes. So it's kind of fun to see one in this shorter style, but still really beautiful, um, complex quilting. And then those really lovely prints on the, the one from, from Persia. In terms of Central Asia, I know you all are familiar with our Central Asian collection after Sacred Scraps a few years ago. Um, so we aren't adding robustly to this collection because Chris Martins, who curated that exhibition and who really is the one who helped us and, and built this collection for us, um, we really feel like it is pretty representative of Central Asia. We still add a few pieces if they're particularly beautiful. And in Uzbekistan, ikat, silk ikat fabrics, where the, um, the warp threads are dyed and then put on the loom in a very specific order, uh, pre-dyed and then, yeah, dressed on the loom. Uh, those ikat fabrics are really, really um, characteristic of Uzbekistan. So anytime we see a piece in good condition with some great ikat um, and with motifs we've never seen before, like these you know, split wagon wheels in an American patchwork quilt, we, we can't turn them down. <laughs> it's just we're not building this collection yeah, with the uh, intensity that we were uh, previously, but a couple more pieces from Central Asia. So here, and then here is a piece from India and then a piece from Tibet. Some really beautiful silk brocaded fabrics. Um, the one on the left possibly could have been used during a, like a wedding ceremony as sort of like a, a tent or a canopy. The one on the right from Tibet is made likely from uh, silks that were brought in from China. So they were probably made in China, but they were brought into Tibet. And often they were given to um, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist um, priests and to the temples 
as sort of offerings from rich or wealthy um, sponsors and patrons. Um, so they had these just really high end uh, silk brocade fabrics in them. And yet they were meant to sort of be used in a very austere setting, in a very religious setting. So there's sort of a, an interesting interplay there between the, the richness of the fabrics and then the setting of, you know, of, of austerity and spirituality. Uh, we have a couple of new pieces from, again, from Persia and moving into Turkey, Western Asia a bit, this beautiful quilted prayer rug. We, I love having prayer rugs in our collection because they take many, many different forms. And obviously the, the um, Muslim world is, is huge, geographically speaking, and in terms of population. So there are many different variations on what a uh, prayer rug can look like. And these, the ones from Persia are often quite elaborate. They have that, um, that backstitch or false quilting that Carolyn loves so much. Um, and this is no exception, but it also just is, has a ton of embroidery as well. Um, and I think some of the, the threads might even be metallic um, wrapped threads. Don't quote me on that because I can't quite tell from this photo. And then this block printed piece from Turkey um, is a little bit unique for our collection. We have lots of whole cloth, uh, several whole cloth quilts from Turkey, but this block print um, is, is a segment that adds to our collection in a new way. Here are a couple more pieces from Turkey. Um, we are trying to firm up our Turkey collection, which sounds really odd to say, the Turkey collection. Um, and Chris Martins, again, is our helper in that effort. She travels to Istanbul every year, although this year will sadly be an exception, but she knows lots of dealers in Istanbul and she goes to the bazaars and the markets. She is she is really my gold standard for a, an intrepid traveler. So we really rely on her to help us um, build these collections. And Turkey is one that, yeah, we are kind of focusing on right now and adding pieces like these that have these uh, really beautiful uh, metallic embroidery um, elements as well as like sequins. These are things that we do want to add uh, to make sure they're represented as a segment of the Turkey collection. This was a fun piece that we got this year. Um, I have been looking for one for a long time. They, you don't come across them very often. They are robes that were more, worn by the Mahdist soldiers uh, in Sudan, in northern Sudan. And this is, we're talking in the last two decades of the 1800s, so the very last part of the 19th century. Um, the, they were rebelling or they were fighting against uh, the Egyptian rulers, and then eventually against the British. It's often called the um, the Sudanese Anglo War, I think. But in any case, the soldiers on the Sudanese side wore these robes with bold appliques on them. Um, and again, they were, um, so they were a very religious uh, group, um, Muslim group. And so the, the patches like this were meant to, again, indicate asceticism or being very frugal. Um, so that is the symbolism behind these. And as I said, they they are not, you don't come across them very often. They're fairly rare on the market. So we were excited to be able to acquire one. Um, moving on, I wanted to um, show you some images. This is an exciting uh, project that's in progress. Uh, we are working with a group of 10 Japanese quilt makers and we have commissioned them to make a quilt for next year's celebration of the 50th anniversary of abstract design in American quilts. In other words, the Holstein quilts at the Whitney show back in 1971. As you all know, we're gonna be doing a series of exhibitions next year focused on that anniversary. And the one I'm working on is looking at the impact that that exhibition had on Japan because the Holstein quilts did travel to Japan in 1975, 1976. So a few years after they had already been in New York and then traveled around the US and gone to Europe, but they also went to Japan. 
And a lot of people saw these shows. They were at big venues in Tokyo and Kyoto. So a lot of people saw these and, and remember the show fondly and remember it as sort of a, a pivotal moment when quilt making really kind of took hold in Japan. So patchwork was already very familiar. Quilting techniques were familiar in Japan and women often had handiwork skills but the form that American quilts take was very new to them. And when they saw these Holstein quilts, you know, it kind of blew their minds. And as we know, ever since then, particularly into the 1980s, quilt making in Japan just kept picking up steam, picking up steam, picking up steam. And it really, it's still going strong today. So the idea we wanted to pursue for the exhibition focused on that theme next year was to ask 10 artists to make a quilt responding to an original abstract design in American quilt quilt. So the little thumbnail you see here is the original Holstein quilt that was in the Whitney show. And then um, the artists have sent uh, photographs of their work in progress. So it's exciting. It's always exciting, I think, to see artists sort of in the midst of, of making a, a piece. Uh, and and on the left, you can see Eiko Okano, who you all will again remember from the exhibition we did of her work a few years ago. Uh, we had several of her kimono quilts in that exhibition, and she really loves that format. So she is responding to that log cabin straight furrows quilt from the Holstein collection and turning it into her own kimono quilt, which I think is really exciting. We asked them to really sort of respond to the original quilt using their own sort of methods, aesthetic choices, sort of make a melding of the original and their own artistic sensibility. On the right, you'll see um, Kuroha-san, Shizuko Kuroha. And yeah, so we see that format or that color palette again of the blues and the tans. Um, that really is what she always um, responds to. Here on the left is Keiko Goke. She's very, very well known Japanese quilt maker. In fact, she had at the Tokyo, the big Tokyo Dome show that takes place every January in, in Tokyo. This year, in, she had, um, I think, one of the major shows within that exhibition. So uh, she was sort of being featured in a retrospective kind of way, really talking about how important she has been in the world of Japanese quilt making. So her piece, I think, responds really beautifully and it uses the colors that she's known for. It takes that somewhat more somber, although still really interesting Holstein quilt and then turns it into something very much her own. Uh, the same goes for Yoshiko Katagiri. Uh, she's probably a little less well known here in the US, but in Japan, she's sort of a star. And I love what she did here because she took that log cabin, which she says she loves, um, but she sort of made it the background and then made this jellyfish applique floating in the foreground, which I just think is wonderful. She, she's actually really well known for her applique rather than her piecing, but you can see in here, she's quite accomplished at both. And I love that she pieced the red log cabin blocks and then shaped them into this jellyfish um, shape that she put on top of very, very somber, dark log cabin blocks. Next we have Suzuko Koseki um, and Harue Konishi. So again, they are taking the original, that little thumbnail piece and turning it very much into something that's uh, reflective of their own work, uh, the way they often work. Um, Konishi-san, uh, she has shown at Quilt National uh, several times and so I think she's, she's starting to be fairly well known in sort of the art quilt world um, here in the U.S. Um, and then finally the other in progress pieces I have to show you, the one on the left is again from Emiko Todalobe. She took that famous kaleidoscope quilt and then combined it with several other quilts that she loves from the Holstein collection. So each artist um, picked their favorite, 
But then Emiko Todalob, I think she liked so many of the Holstein quilts that she she started with her favorite, but then added on some motifs from some of the other Holstein quilts that she really loved. And Fumiko Fujita, she's a graphic designer, or Kumiko, excuse me, Fujita. Uh, she's a graphic designer, or graphic design is really her area. And also she is drawn to sort of the modern quilt um, movement. And I don't know if she's a member formally of the Modern Quilt Guild, but um, that is certainly more where her aesthetic preferences lie. So you can really see uh, how much she loves bold graphic um, designs, but I think she does a wonderful job of incorporating that log cabin or schoolhouse format or block into her piece. I think I have one last slide for you all. Um, I wanted to share, because we are living in this strange, strange time of um, a global pandemic. A, a story was just recently shared with me by Gita Candlewall. Some of you may recognize her name. She was a long time international advisory board member from India. She's from Mumbai, India. And several of us have had the great pleasure of visiting her at her home in Mumbai. Um, and she's been just a wonderful supporter of ours for years and years. Many of her quilts were included in collecting and recollecting. And when I was in touch with her recently, I just asked, you know, how, what's happening in India right now in terms of coronavirus? Are people making masks the same way we are here? She said, yes, they very much are. And then here's this other story I want to tell you. This gentleman um, is her acupressurist. So I don't know if there's a special Hindi term for that, but she called it acupressure. Um, and he uh, was living in Mumbai when coronavirus, of course, suddenly or hit, and he was unable to make it home to his home state of Orissa. Orissa is on the eastern coast of India, and Mumbai is on the west coast. So he was unable to go home, and he was really sad um, because his wife had just given birth to their first child and so he was unable to go home and be with his family. Um, Gita had invited him to come live at at her home because he was also he also ended up not having a home in Mumbai anymore either. So he was staying at her house and she said to help you feel better I'd like to teach you how to make a quilt. Um, and so he made this quilt with her help and it's a crib quilt for his new baby and it incorporates fabrics that are sort of typical of the state of Orissa, where he is from. And so that really sort of warmed, warmed my heart again um, to hear that story, to hear of all the people who are coming together to make things to help other people out or to commemorate this, this strange time that humans are, are navigating right now. But I thought that was just a really wonderful story.